now that you built the house, now we can just live in it. <laughs> and you released your new album without a label in, in the US at least. Um, yeah, that's right. <laughs> really? Yeah. I mean, isn't that, is that the total freedom that that one always longs for or something? Or yeah, absolutely. I mean, for us, it's been um, a lot of years <clears throat> signed to uh, record companies. And uh, although they provided a lot of good support, um, just because, just like, you know, we got signed up kind of in the early days. Uh, I mean, ultimately, you don't ever own your records. You know, there's no ownership involved with the artists that make it. So that's one exciting part of this release is that we do own it, and we're taking control of how it's been being released in the in the states. And then over here, we're using uh, kind of more traditional means, just because every country has its own mechanism for uh, for doing doing things. So uh, yeah, it's it's going to be a really fun, exciting time. I just saw the film Singles again after what? many years. It was 15 when I came out and, and it was strange because it seemed very long ago but still very close. How, how did, did you, you have any lines in Singles or was it just Jeff? I think I did. I think I had a couple. I think you Jeff bank at that time? I mean, is it just a go, a gone and, and over or is that time still a part of your lives? It's kind of ancient history. I mean, I vaguely remember parts of it, you know, but... Uh, I remember seeing it in the theater at the premiere, but I was absolutely hammered. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I think I was, too. Yeah. I just love the idea of, of Pearl Jam's constant struggle for, like, honesty and independence and, and you know, staying away of all these um, music industry things and, like, just fight against uh, Ticketmaster and all that. Is that something that, that kept Pearl Jam going, uh, not only in the early days, but somehow still does? I mean, yeah, well, ever since I joined up in 98, I mean, I've, I was super impressed just by how um, in-house everything is and how much control the group actually really does have over their careers, which is, um, pretty much the exact opposite of, of how a lot of groups at this level operate. So I think that's really enabled the group to have longevity and just feel good about, you know, like Eddie was saying, the house that we built. You know, it's been it's been a long time coming, but uh, the house is, is pretty radical right now and we all we all really love living in it. Um, and it's and it's it is it's a lot harder to have this much control You know, and so it's it's a real testament to how well we all get along and how there's a real open line lines of communication, um, and a lot of you know a lot of the decision making does come from the from the band. So uh, so there's a lot on the table for us. It's a, definitely a full time job, even even when we're not touring and uh, playing live and or uh, making records. So um, there's more work because of it, but it ultimately it you know it's, it pays off because we're able to present the group in a real honest way. What do you associate with the with the term grunge? Is that does that mean anything to you or is it a made up word or was it a movement or, or what is it does it mean anything? Grunge me being on a camping trip and, and, and having forgotten your toothpaste. <laughs> <laughs> no, to me of course it was always Lots of meaning with that. Yeah, sure. And everything. Sure. Uh, the question is, is that just made up and put into my head, or by media, or by anyone, or does it, is it actually, is there actually something? Like that? Well, there's a history to the word, you know, and and um, but what it ended up, you know, it ended up being a term that was applied to a lot of bands that that you know, there's there's. I think there's certain bands that you could say for us were more of that sound. It seems like Mud Honey is kind of the ultimate version of that, um, and and like their first couple records. Um, after that, you know, it feels like like a word with a lot of baggage, and and it's it's something that like baggage is stuff that you carry around. But then there's some good stuff in there if you take it out and spend the time to open it. You know, it was. You know, grunge was very that even that term. That was really good for us, I suppose, because we ended up being lumped together with a bunch of other great bands as well. You know, but we were all really different. You know, Soundgarden was, you know, there were similarities, but 
crazily different than you know our band, and um, you know they they took it to a, a level that we're still working on. You know, the, every every Soundgarden record was a galvanized piece of. Um, you know, it was a really focused vision and, and um, powerful, powerful records with no holes in them. And then you had Tad and you had Screaming Trees and you had uh, Alice in Chains and you had uh, Gas Suffer and, you know, all this, a lot of sub-pop bands and um, Fastbacks and I don't know. Then it became kind of Northwest sound. Well, the first actually, right, in, in Seattle at least, I mean, you... You've experienced it before, in the 80s. So yeah, yeah. Did, did something happen? Did something change? I think it was just sort of an evolution of a really good Northwest music scene that has been there since the 60s, like with the Whalers and, and Sonics and everything like that. Um, and, um, you know, uh, it's the birthplace of Hendrix. Uh, Hart was from there. Um, you know, I mean, there's just been a really cool sort of musical history in that region. and. Um, maybe it's just something in the air, something in the water that just created a uh, unique musician. The <laughs> and there's water in the air. And there's also, uh, yeah, well, there's other stuff too. But um, yeah, I, you know, luckily uh, our local music scene, like in the late 80s, that was presented by Sub Pop, had a really sort of clear vision, you know, and I think it was easy to sort of promote that, especially here in Europe and in the UK. Um, as a thing, and I think that's what people sort of gravitated to initially. And then, you know, Nirvana just made it go through the stratosphere, so um, it was sort of like this perfect storm that happened. And um, But luckily, there was a lot of really unique musicians, you know. I mean, there was a real concentration of, you know, uniqueness in that part of the world at that time. I mean, and actually there, there still is, you know, there's a lot of great Northwest bands coming out still to this day that sound nothing like we did in the, in the, in the 80s, you know. And luckily, you know, we're still going strong and, and I think we're still evolving, you know, quite, quite a bit. And I think that's always been the goal for great art is just to keep evolving. Do you think that it, the idea or the thing or the music was corrupted by the industry? Yeah, I, I suppose. I mean, a lot of groups sort of moved there to, in hopes of getting signed. I think the uh, the emphasis changed um, from why people wanted to play music in the first place. Like when we started, we wanted to, we just wanted to play music. You know, we wanted it to be our own thing. We wanted to forge our own sound. You know, so yeah, maybe it did get it changed a little bit when the industry focus uh, was all was all gravitating towards the Northwest. But once that went away, it's, it settled down and there's cool bands like Fleet Foxes and Death Cab for Cutie and, you know. Yeah, I mean, so there's just still, there's, you know, it's, it's kind of come back to the reasons why it was good in the first place. Do you ever, did you ever have the feeling of being part of some Generation X and with like, Lots of opportunities and nowhere to go, or all these, this feeling that maybe I don't know, maybe it was just my puberty, or maybe it was actually a generation thing. Well, I remember reading, you know, as a, as a fan of British music and you know the Kinks and the Who, and reading, you know, about Tuesdays at the Marquee, you know, about the Who, and this is 15 years into them. So this is 1979. I'm reading about the Who, and I'm. 14 or something and I'm I'm sitting there and wishing you know angry at my parents for me not having been born a lot earlier even though they would have only been they were the same age as the people in the bands but it was just that this this is I wish I could have lived during Hendrix I wish I could have lived you know to be in these clubs to see the who I wish I could have been part of the mods you know and then You know, years later, when this, I, I do remember having this realization after, you know, the record was out and all of a sudden Seattle and this thing was happening and, you know, and I just moved up there and, you know, the year before the record came out or something. And I felt this community and I thought, like, and I'm, at this point I'm 26 or 27, and I'm just like, wow, I think, 
This, uh, yeah, we're actually part of something. Like I, uh, I'm actually part of this thing. I, I, who knew? And it doesn't happen that often, you know. It doesn't really, at least not on that scale, for better or worse. But um, it doesn't happen that often. There was a realization, you know, that we were part of something bigger. And it was pretty exciting until the wave kind of broke on our heads, and then it, it you know, that that moment of exciting of you know, catching the wave and riding the wave before it came up and, you know, slammed us pretty hard. It, it, was, it was pretty neat for about a week. I actually think... A couple it, days, maybe. I don't know. I think something like that hasn't happened since then. You know, maybe the digital world doesn't allow real movements to grow or something. I don't know. Maybe. I mean, yeah, when we've... All first started, it was sort of pre-internet, pre-computer, almost pre-MTV, you know, so we were left to our own devices, and I think ultimately that helped, that helped our music to become our own thing. And it probably happens on smaller, uh, smaller levels that just don't get tapped into. Right. Um, and maybe that's a good thing. But, you know, there's really yeah. good scenes in, like, D.C., um, uh, Portland. Yeah, there's a great new lo-fi scene in San Diego that I've, that I've been reading mm. about, this band called Waves, so, mm. you know, mm -hmm. it's out there. Now you, you're re, you have reissues of 10 and you have reissues of the other albums. Um, is that something you, is that an idea that you really support and like and, you know, looking back again or is it sometimes maybe even painful to look back too much? Uh, the only, you know, you just look at it as wanting to put out a piece of quality, you know, something of, of, of high quality that, that um, people can glean more off of than they remember from the, you know, offer them new things that they haven't seen before or heard before. And, and it's just, it's more of a quality issue that takes time. And, you know, outside of that, I think we were just about to start this, this record, this last one, when we were kind of working with the artwork and all that. So it's really just a, it's just a time thing and making sure it's, it's, you know, the best quality as possible. You know, good vinyl and good artwork and, um, you know, because it does, it, you know, and then we had to decide whether it was going to cost a little bit more and have, because in order to make it feel solid, It's gonna have to cost a little bit more. And we, you know, it's hard. You have to make these decisions, you know. Um, but in, in, ultimately, I think we're proud of it. I mean, I didn't listen to any of it, but I certainly <laughs> helped put the books together and all that. So you rather not look back so much? Uh, you know, it's enough playing the songs, you know, you know, almost on a nightly basis. You know, I, you look back a lot when you're in a band for this long. You know, it just it just kind of happens. And, you know, you write songs that when you're a certain age and then you end up singing them over and over. And it's funny because it's, it's almost like that kid is, is reminding me of things that I used to think of and that I should not forget, you know? It's like I was sending myself messages in a time capsule. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. Yeah, that's, I mean, for, for a fan like me, it's, it's <clears throat> similar, very similar. So. I couldn't say that the songs have lost their meaning or something just because I'm 20 years old. Yeah. How is that for you? That's how it is with a lot of songs too, you know, you, you hear like protest songs, you know, you know, four years ago what we've gone through with yeah. our country and, the, and the, the politicians who are representing us as American citizens, you know, it was very tough and, and, and then you come across songs like, uh, you know, Masters of War or you know, these, these Dylan diatribes or a Pete Seeger song or a Woody Guthrie song. These were written, you know, almost 100 years ago, some of them. And it's absolutely applies to what happened in the last, you know, few years and in some ways it's still going on. So sometimes it's a shame, you know, when you sing something like Masters of War, you play it, you, you just, you wish it lost its relevance. So you can't wait for the day when it loses its relevance, you know. The other thing, it's an incredibly long song, and you just don't want to have to remember those words anymore. <laughs> <laughs> to, to look into the past one last time, um, 
I'm wondering if um, if the mid '90s maybe were the the hardest time for the entire. I mean, maybe something died when Kurt Cobain died. Maybe it was just too much, too much commercial pressure. Yeah, I mean, that was sort of a galvanizing, you know, uh, time when the air was taken out of everyone's sails. You know, it really, you know, it's like. It was just such a shock, and um, it made, I don't know, it made me rethink some things about, you know, what I was doing, but it never, I never really lost focus of, you know, why I was doing it personally, um, but, uh, yeah, I suppose, you know, you could pinpoint that, that event as, you know, one, one, you know, one reason why some of the bands started to implode, but... There, there was a, a variety of reasons, you know. It wasn't, it wasn't just that, but um, it was certainly uh, a, pretty, a pretty tough time because we lost, a, you know, we lost a really good friend, and and it happened in such a violent way and everything. And so it's just, there's always questions when that happens, and sometimes you have to like question yourself. Sometimes, like, you know. And like Matt was saying, you know, it happened, you know. Other bands were going through things and it wasn't, you know, they were imploding for this reason or that reason or this pressure or that misunderstanding. And, and, and then you think, you know, it's such a good job and, you you know, you, you don't really set out thinking that it could be a job because that's a bit in the clouds, you know. But to, you know, do this thing that you love that's your lifeblood, it's the one thing that's kind of been yours all your life and almost like a religion or, or you know like a parent's love you go to mu music for comfort and strength and then to have it you know to not be able to do it or, or to have to break up a band because of this and that it's it's really something you fight against you know and I, I it's funny to think that it would be that hard and I think that um, you know if, if why, how could music be so hard? How could making music and surviving as a band and communicating with people, and how could it be so hard? Apparently it is. Um, and you know what you said before too about freedom and having freedoms, whether it's with, in how we distribute music or whatever, that's the other thing. It's like, if you can't have freedom as a, as a musician or as a, as a kid who grew up wanting to be in a band and then gets to be in a band, and you know, if you can't have freedom, then like who can? You know, what about the plumbers? They're totally fucked. <laughs> you know, or what about other jobs? But they don't have to be a hero for an entire generation and carry no, so we much. we don't either. I mean, that's not... It shouldn't be that. It's the music. It's not the people, right? So it's just, you know, we're to the point where it's like, well, if, if, if you can't have fun and be in a band, and if you can't, like, have feel like you're free and be in a band, and, and if it can't feel easy, at least sometimes, then it feels like... Everything's fucked. You know, it's like we're, being a musician is almost like a barometer of, it's like the canary in the coal mine. If the, if the musicians aren't having a good time, <laughs> the whole planet's fucked.